the Pizza Hut, 100% cash pack, $10 max. How does that work? There's a couple of merchants that do it kind of routinely, I would say. They offer new customers 100% cash back. Rationally might make sense to do 100% cash back depending on what your current CPA is. Others do it to just purely drive revenue and sales in a short amount of time. We've got about 2.5 million Aussies that use shop back, about 40 million across all of our market. And we've given Aussies about $200 million worth of cash back over the last six years. It was our second birthday. We basically dressed up the whole team as clowns. We went to a studio and did a Facebook Live. Then actually it got so popular that our app couldn't handle the traffic and crashed and the live shut down. And so we were all in the office like, oh my God, my team that who dressed up as clowns haven't quite forgiven us yet for the experience, but you know, we <laughs> you can't enjoy your job 100%, can you? <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. I've always, I've used cashback for the last probably two years. I remember I, I used to always go on Oz Bargain and these yeah. cashback things would just keep popping up again and again. I was like, what is this cashback thing? How, how does it work? Like, how do you get money for just buying things? Like, this doesn't make sense. But eventually I was like sick. I was like, okay, let me try figure this out. I think I maybe signed up for cash rewards and I signed up for shop back. And then I started getting the hang of it. I started understanding it. Um, and, and I'm very excited to dig into the business model today because I'm pretty curious on how the business model works. And I'm glad to have you on the show, Angus. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and I'm, I'm be, be happy to dispel any myths or, or uh, you know, unknowns that you still have on, on our business as well. So I guess, Angus, what has been your main focus over the last six months? Has it just been, I guess, being the CEO of Shopback in Australia, the managing director? Yeah, I, I mean, like the last six months, it goes pretty quick in, in well, I mean, Shopback's, we're, coming, we're 10 years old as a business. Uh, right, we're across 12 markets today. In Australia, we've, we've been here for six years and the last six years have, have gone super fast and in the last six months. I think the last six months has been a really interesting one for us. We see, you know, the 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 macro economy uh, or just macro conditions in general have been really challenging for, for, for consumers. They've been very uh, challenging for, for businesses, bigger and small. As everyone tries to figure out, you know, like how do, how do we grow in these conditions? I'll give you an example. Like some of the best businesses were born in the middle of a of you know some kind of recessionary kind of environment. So I used to work for Groupon. It was born in twenty uh, two thousand and eight in Chicago, and had you know enormous success off the back of the GFC. And so you know, whilst we're not in those conditions, we're still focused here at, at Shopback. Just trying to figure out, like, hey, so, you know, this is a new normal for the next two, three years. How do we position our business? Um, how do we message correctly to, to customers? How do we give them the maximum amount of value, especially when times are a bit tough, you know? Um, but the price of fuel's not going down. It hasn't been anytime soon. Um, interest rates are, are flat and, and looking that way for a while. So our job really is, is you know, more solid than ever, and we can play a bigger part in customers' lives more than ever. Um, with these kind of conditions, I believe. Interesting. When you talk about the new normal, um, has these conditions made it tougher for shop back or has it actually made it easier because people want more cash back? Yeah, I, I think on like, cause it's shop back serves two different groups. So, you know, on one side of our marketplace, we've got on the demand side, we've got consumers and we've got about 2.5 million Aussies that use shop back about 40 million across all of our all of our markets. Um, and they come to us to be able to see, you know, the best deals, the best offers. And of course, like our main value proposition is to earn cash back. And we've given Aussies about $200 million worth of cash back over the last six years. So not a small sum. And then on the other side of our marketplace are merchants. And they're, you know, think about any merchant from any category. So from travel, we've got, we work with booking.com and Expedia and, and Agoda and, and more. Uh, marketplaces, Amazon, eBay, uh, Timu, uh, all the way through to groceries with Coles and Woolworths and alcohol merchants like BWS and Coles, Coles Liquor Group. And so both both sides of the marketplace are, are kind of wanting different things. And from a consumer standpoint, like what, what they're really after is seeing really, really good offers from, you know, leading brands all the way through to, you know, Aussie favorites so that they can you know, find new new ways to shop. So new merchants to shop from. Um, and at the same time, they can save. And from a merchant side of, um, you know, it 
the, the macro economy hasn't really changed so much on that side. It's they're still always trying to find the most effective way to reach audiences. So, you know, you see globally cost per clicks or cost per impressions, they only go one way, right? They're only going up year on year. That's is it. That's it. You know, Zuckerberg's got billions of people in his audience. That's not likely to grow. So the only way he can grow is through pricing, which means higher cost per impressions for, for, for advertisers. And so our job for merchants, um, you know, be it booking.com, Expedia or, or local uh, Aussie retailers is to give them the highest return on ad spend we can um, through the shop back channel and introduce them to new new customers, reactivate old customers or just drive revenue. It really depends on what their their objectives are, I'd say. Interesting. So yeah. when you guys do a promotion with say booking.com and you go from the standard say 2% cash back to like, hey, for the next 24 hours, it's 10% cash back. Mm. What is happening there behind the scenes? So, well, I mean, I let me give you the end-to-end -end picture. So I guess, you know, we work with these brands 365 days of the year. They're on Shopback. Um, they see us as like a, you know, a, like a digital shopping center. So not unlike a Westfield where, you know, we we set up a, an area for them in the shopping center. And our job is to bring as many customers into that shopping center as possible. But instead of charging these merchants a rent like a, a Westfield or a shopping center does, we charge them on a cost per sale basis. What that means is we only charge them when a customer's purchased something or in the case of travel, they booked a stay. And then the brand pays us a commission um, once that the returns period has passed or the person stayed in the hotel. Now, we keep some of that commission and then the rest of it we give to the customers as cash back. So that's kind of like going back to your question at the start is like demystifying this, you know, too good to be true kind of notion of, getting paid to shop. When it comes to what happens when a brand goes from say 2% to 10%, effectively we run campaigns, you know, we're right in the middle of Amazon Prime Day at the moment. And so our job is to, to be able to give brands, you know, premium placements, whether it's on our website or our app or, or our email. And for that, um, there's, there's, a, there's a placement fee, um, you could call it. And so they, they increase their cashback rates to reach um, bigger audiences and to get better exposure. And in turn, the beauty of it is it's a win-win-win, right? So they're getting, the brand's getting more exposure. Um, the customer's getting more cash back and Shopback's getting more sales. So we're creating this kind of win-win-win partnership versus a, you know, a social uh, like Meta, Google, billboards, radio, you name it. There's there's only, there's no win there for um for the customer and then at the same time there's a lot of wasted advertising spend that goes on through those channels as well interesting so like hypothetically is a usual scenario where if you sort of refer and get customers to convert with a brand or company they might give you five percent in sort of affiliate fees and then say two percent you would give back to the customer you'll keep the re remaining three percent and during the promotional periods, they're like, hey, we're willing to give you 15% instead of the usual 5% because we want to get more orders in. And then you increase the cashback you give to customers from 2% to 10%. Is that how it works when you guys have those promotions? That's, it. That's exactly right. I mean, at the end of the day, we'd love to be able to pass back all of the commissions that we, we get from the merchants. But we need to keep the lights on. We need to pay salaries. So Shopback does keep a margin, um, but at the same time, it's very, it's an it's an interesting balance because effectively it's a pricing, you know, it, it's the equivalent of you know having a great price on a sale on the shelf in a in a in a um, normal retail store during promotional periods. You know that better pricing will drive volume and transactions and garner more interest. And um, and I think the balance that we strike is being able to give customers a really rewarding experience through great cashback rates. At the same time, we still need to deliver a healthy return on ad spend for our merchants. Um, and at the same time, uh, we need to make sure that Shopback's running as a, as a, you know, a profitable uh, entity as well. Do you guys reach out to merchants to do these promotions or do they usually come to you and be like, Hey, we're ready to increase the amount of, um, commission we give to you guys or do you guys hey hey like this is a good period we think if we do a promotion it's like a win-win 
How does it usually happen? And do you also know which companies or brands or websites are worth more to promote? Because when you do, there is more sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that to answer your first question, it's a bit of both. So we we run a, an annual campaign calendar. And so no surprises, some of the biggest days in the retail calendar, BFCM, right? Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Boxing Day is, is probably number two, I would say, behind um, uh, Black Friday. But then, you know, we have our own events. So we run Shop Back Birthday. We run um, monthly campaigns that to give merchants an opportunity to, to buy into these. So they'd be the ones that we go out and we, you know, we talk directly to merchants or through affiliate networks like Rakuten, uh, Commission Factory, Partnerize or Impact. We can, we can talk to um, merchants at scale through those guys, but then direct, we work directly with, with some merchants. So that'd be the pre-planning, which we really optimize for because it, it gives everyone a lot of time to plan and, and you know, give certainty to our merchants with respect to their revenue um, planning. But then the really interesting thing is we, we we find that there's merchants will use Shopback because we have a big base. We've got two and a half million customers in Australia. Let's say they're running behind on their you know quarterly or monthly targets. They can call us and within two hours or less, we can actually have an offer out in market in front of consumers and really driving demand quickly. Uh, we call this the Shopback red button. So if they've got, they're sitting in a meeting, they're like, Wow, we're behind on our numbers. What channels can we can we uh, lean on to drive really quick revenue in a short amount of time? You can't do it through Meta. You can't do it through Google. That there, there are, that's a longer period that it needs to scale. Um, you can't do it through blogs or, or communities, but you can do it through uh, a business like Shopback, where we can send a push notification to two and a half million people, and in a very quick, you know, fifteen minute period, um, we can bring large amounts of traffic to the site to convert. We've done that with, I won't name names, but big box retailers. We sell gift cards as well. Um, and we can sell, we sold approximately, it was a million dollars worth of gift cards in less than 24 hours after a phone call um, from the merchant that was really just looking to drive a lot of sales. Um, There's so, something that we've kind of um, figured out how to market correctly and um, to, sp to spike interest in, in consumer or to drive kind of, um, consumer um, purchasing change, we, we've figured that out and we can deploy that for a lot of merchants. To answer the second part of your question though, Andy, like, you know, not all merchants are the same. And I, I think that, that that's a realistic thing to understand is a brand that you, is a household name brand versus um, a, a, like a, a brand that's lesser known, just won't, simply won't drive the same amount of demand across any metric you look at, whether it's first time buyers, lapse buyers, or just pure revenue. I think that they're, they're kind of relative in scale um, when it come, when you look at their proxy, their website traffic, and you can probably imagine the scale that, that it might bring. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, like, is it possible for a smaller merchant to grow with Shopback? Like for example, let's say I have a small teeth widening kit brand and you know I'm hidden somewhere in the shop back, and you know people can get ten percent off if they go through shop back to purchase my teeth whitening kit. But it's like hidden down below in the website. And I was like, hey guys, like I want to do a promotion where I'll give you forty percent commission on each sale. But even though I'm willing to do that, it might not be worth it for you guys to blast this small brand to your two point five million customers. How do you judge that, or is that? Do you say no? Do you say yes? Has there been time you said yes? Do you, do you have a teeth whitening brand? We can give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Not unfortunately. <laughs> no, I, I, there's a couple of ways we do that. So the the first one is that our we've most of our orders come through our app. So we're about 70, 75% of all orders come through the shop back app, which is actually an interesting, <laughs> an interesting discussion to pick up a bit later on. But the the app traffic is is super strong and what we've done is we've built personalization into the app so we've got three different ml models or machine learning models that run um different components of, of the the application so we're able to you know we've got four and a half thousand uh, merchants or brands that partner with shopback and it's impossible in a small screen to be able to display them or give them discoverability options so that hence we built 
uh, personalization, which the three models uh, based on you know what we think you might want to buy, what others like you have bought, um, and what's trending. And so smaller merchants will naturally surface day in, day out through the models. When it comes to other opportunities, you, yes, is a short answer. Um, and we can discuss things like, you know, placements in the app or placements on the website or placements in an email. But yeah, I, I'm with you though, you know, like um, maybe a push notification or one of the very noisy um, assets that we have, like an in-app pop-up. So it's like the TikTok, you know, first in feed that like, that's a very premium asset. It costs a lot of money. So maybe a teeth whitening, small to medium business wouldn't move towards that, but they may move towards something else that we've got uh, across the three platforms. When you do do the push notification email blast for, the, I guess, the big brands that are worth it, um, do they have to pay a placement fee or is the increased commission already that that is the sort of placement fee? Um, a bit of a combination of both. It depends on the campaign. You know, uh, it depends on um, the brand, it depends on quite a number of factors, but typically speaking, you know, we want to make sure that customers don't care if Shopback gets placement fees, customers care what the cashback rates are. So of course we always index towards giving the most richest shopping experience possible to the customer. Um, but then we create other placements outside of say a push notification that brands can buy and opt into for a longer time. So a good example is like Timu. Uh, sponsored quite a few of our campaigns. And so we do a shop back bought to you by Timu. And that gives Timu not just exposure on the day to our customers, but exposure over a longer period of time in premium placement assets. Got it. Okay. One thing that I definitely want to get your thoughts on and, and demystify is the 100% is the cash back. Like you often see the Pizza Hut, 100% cash back, $10 max. How does that work? How do people get a free pizza? And like, what happens if a ton of people do it? How does it work? Yeah, have you, you, you mentioned you're on Ausbargain before? Yes. Yeah, uh, one of the best communities for, for sourcing offers, like best prices. It's Amazon Prime Day today. And Ausbargain is like a free for all. There's so, much, so many good, good offers for customers there. I think these 100% cashback offers always find their way on there as well. And it's a, like, why do it? I think there's a couple of merchants that do it kind of routinely, I would say. And the reason for it is that, would they have they have multiple reasons. One might be that they offer new customers 100% cash back. So they, they, they've they done the backend math and thought, okay, so from my margin, this is how much I, I'm, I'm sacrificing here, or this is the cost of goods and the cost of the margin. This is what I'm gonna be sacrificing and then backed it out to what their current cost, cost per acquisition is. And it rationally might make sense to do 100% cash back, depending on what your current CPA is. Um, others do it to just purely drive revenue and sales in a short amount of time. The other, the other reason for it would be like, let's say on a, you know, for example, it's state, it's state of origin night tonight. And I'm not saying, we're not going to go live tonight, I don't think. But um, <laughs> the um, the other reason might be that a brand might want to just completely take mind share and wallet share at a certain moment of time and giving customers like essentially something for free, right? Like a, a $10 pizza um, is a good way to do that. And are there limits to it? Like, for example, what happens if you do the promotion and so many people order on the state of origin night, does Pizza Hut know how much commission they're going to be sending your way? Um, can they estimate it? Um, yeah. Yeah, we're pretty good at forecasting. And typically we do try and like, you know, some of these 100% cashback offers, they're very good for customers, even if we restrict it to one track transaction per person. So we can kind of, we can forecast it out. There has been some instances where we've not had a, a cap on there and You'd be surprised, like people, you know, are willing to buy a lot of pizza and then space deliveries out over a month because if you can, if you can pre pre order, um, so we 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 learn and and we we change along the way, and I think that the the the, the number one concern we have is obviously protecting merchants and making sure that their budgets are intact at the end of a promotion. So there would be some T's and C's that are not too arduous. So one per person capped at $10, 
I think that's reasonable and um, that, that goes a long way to give merchants comfort to run these kind of spiky promotions that would be harder to do through other channels. As I'm thinking about it, so like those 100% cash back on pizzas, that's definitely like a loss leader, whereas like a lot of the other promos where it's gone from 5 to 10%, 5 to 15%, there's a good chance that the merchant's still making profit despite sort of giving you guys their cut. Are there other example of interesting loss leaders, promotional campaigns that you guys have done? Yeah, I think I think the the number one like the working principle is that every category has a different margin. So the the margin in supermarket versus electronics versus alcohol versus travel, they're going to be wildly different. And so that kind of dictates the the commission that that dictates the the commission that shop back gets. It also therefore dictates the the cash back that the customer gets. So I think principally we need to be really focused to uh, allow merchants to kind of openly talk about what their margins are and then what kind of commissions or, or CPAs that might allow shop back. Around loss leaders, like I, I think it's a very interesting point because you see this deployed supermarkets is a great example. You know, the milk and bread strategy that that supermarkets employ where it's kind of like, you know, we want to get certain items down to, well, we're, we're happy to loss lead and we're happy to be the most competitive in the market around certain items. But then in other items, we, you know, that's where we'll kind of, you know, I come in for my milk, but then I also go and, and you know, buy other staples that I'll need for home. And because I, I came in because of that milk, because of the loss leader. So we do, I mean, we we're, it, it's an interesting theory that we're looking at is, how can we learn from other categories with respect to what consumers are, uh, what, what what are they most interested in? And then how can we cross sell them into or help them explore other parts of Shopback and build their customer lifetime value over a number of transactions versus requiring that first one to be profitable at the outset? Interesting. I think this is a perfect segue to the next question is the cashback space it's like an interesting space where maybe I'm just imposing my worldview, but it doesn't seem to have customer loyalty. Whereas like I use all three of the top cashback brands and I bet every Oz Bargain user probably does the same. Is that the, the case? And is that, do you find sort of people using multiple cashback companies and, and people don't really get associated or stuck with one? Um, yeah. It's a, it, there's no right answer or there's no exact answer that I can give you outside of this, which is we've researched, we've done the research on, on a um, all of our customers, like a meaningful um, sample. And we, what we know is that there are some that are 100% brand loyal and it's, it's kind of similar to most people, the first food delivery app they download, they'll stick with it. They won't bother about downloading the other two. And so we have quite a loyal base that is um, they've been with Shopback for a while or perhaps they've just, they enjoy our UX or experience or, um, you know, offering more than others. And they're, 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 they're super loyal. There's another subset, um, which is much, much smaller, which is people who are probably more price, people who are more price sensitive and they, they tend to shop around a little bit more. And I think that that's... Um, understandable you know you probably don't go to the same service station every day right like you probably um you might go to the same supermarket but it's kind of what's convenient to you and you know say if you're on a forum or a community group and you can see that others have got different offerings then i guess that that's a that's that would lead you into trying different things um but we, we really try our best to try to create um a real like a like such a good customer experience on Shopback, whether it's through our product and our app, um, whether it's through the frequency and the cadence of the, the cashback offers and the richness of the cashback offers, or even launching new verticals like gift cards or QR payments where, where people can spend their cashback they've earned from online transactions in store. It really creates a retent, like quite a retentive or like a, a flywheel, I guess, uh, for customers to give them strong reasons to want to use Shopback. Interesting. What's sort of the market share like between, I guess, shop back, cash rewards, top cash back? Is it similar to like Coles and Audi and Woolworths or I guess 
Amazon Australia and eBay Australia? Or is it like the ride sharing where I feel like majority of people just use Uber? And then I guess there's some people that use Diddy. There was Ola before Ola sort of died out. But Uber has somehow built a monopoly in the ride sharing space. And I guess maybe there is a barrier to entry, but then supermarkets have a huge barrier to entry yet. Well, I guess maybe Woolworths has a bigger monopoly on the supermarket sort of space, but I guess you're right. I, I do go to Audi. I, I do go to Coles if it's convenient. What's the market share like when it comes to the cashback space? Is it pretty evenly split or is there a leader? Mm. I, I think maybe, maybe I'll just go back a few years to, to give a little bit of context. So we, um, we launched in, in Singapore in 2014. We didn't launch in Australia until 2018. And there was a competitor here who had been here for four years, um, kind of, you know, scaling. And within 18 months, we, we managed to go past them um, with respect to, to members. And I think today, like if I speak to to merchants, which is really where the when we get a sense of the scale, we're anywhere anywhere between you know ten to thirty percent, driving more t driving ten to thirty percent more volume than anyone else in the affiliate space. So let alone cashback space. I think that there's always going to be newcomers that that come to the market. So we saw in the early days, like around 2019, 2020. There's like a lot of newcomers that popped up, even with different value propositions. So some allow you to earn cash back, put it into your super. Um, there's even a new one now that I saw, which you earn cash back and it goes straight into your road toll account. So there's there's quite, oh, then crypto, remember the crypto thing, which was like earn cash back and, you know, get Bitcoins. So uh, there's always going to be new and interesting competitors that come with different propositions and customer experiences. Um, but I think when it comes to, shop back we, we, what we're good at is launching in new markets and we've got a very healthy track record of scaling to a market leading position within 18 months and today that's true for i believe 11 of our 12 markets that we're in uh including new zealand where we just launched interesting we talked about sort of customer loyalty what about merchant loyalty? Because I see like all these brands, they're on all the cashback. Like it's it's like, they're not on one, they're on every. And I guess during Prime Day, we could see every sort of cashback um, company have an Amazon Prime offer. And I guess I'm just looking with the one with the highest percentage and I'll just go there. Um, I might do multiple two or three if I want to sort of stack it into two separate orders. Um, but is that normal in, in like in the marketing space for because like i guess most brands would work with one agency when it comes to marketing but i guess the affiliate space is an interesting space where they could work with all three it, it is yeah i, I think it's it, the affiliate marketing world has uh, you were talking to was it gary caught on about this like briefly about the affiliate marketing space and i was listening to that last night and it's interesting how it's evolved in Australia a lot. So, um, and, and, and right around the world as well, whereby you've got this affiliate channel, um, you know, you've got your performance marketing um, channel, you've got your out of home or above the line channel, uh, you've got your below the line channels, and then you've got the affiliate channel. And it's, it's still in its, in its infancy in Australia. But if I go back, you know, five years, six years, it was kind of a very small part of an, of a, CMO's marketing mix. Whereas today now it's true that we can be driving upward of 5% of all of their revenue um, against all other channels, including paid social, so meta and and uh, you know, TikTok and more. So I think that the the affiliate marketing space broadly is getting more attention as it scales, as it becomes more meaningful to, to CMOs as spends go up in the channel, you know, obviously performance is required with an increase in spend. But the, 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 the mix of the affiliate channel is unchanged or, or largely unchanged. So you've got, you know, you've got your blogs, you've got influencers, you've got cashback and loyalty, you've got price comparison. So there's multiple different, um, uh, multiple different modes within or channels within the affiliate channel itself. But then to your question around like why, like there's a lot of brands that have opted into the affiliate channel and they're there, they're present, you know, year round on, on as many um, platforms as they can be to, to extend their reach. 
There's some that are more selective and narrow their focus on in the affiliate channel and only work with certain types of publishers or, um, or, or limit the amount of publishers within one category. So like blogs or, or cashback and loyalty. And then there's some merchants that just haven't quite discovered the affiliate channel yet for whatever reason. It could be budget constraints. It could be um, headcount or personnel constraints. And to, to run a good affiliate program, say, let, let's say through a business like Shopback, okay, so you need a budget. Um, and it makes sense because it's cost per sale and the ROI is demonstrable and, and higher than other channels. So it makes sense to at least test or, or scale. And then the other thing is you, you, you need someone to partner with us to be able to have conversations about optimizing performance, about opting into key retail moments so that you're present and and customers can be introduced to you. So I think there's a bit of there's a, a a barrier to entry for those who have never thought about it before that they it's actually not that hard to overcome when you we can have a chat to them and say this is how you get started this is what we think with respect to budgets let's set up a you know, and a light touch marketing plan to start with so that you can kind of dip your toe in the water, see how it works, make sure you get the performance you're expecting. Interesting. When you're talking about budget needed, given that the affiliate space, cash say it's sort of commission only, why would then a budget be needed or what would the barrier to entry be? I thought it'd be like sort of no barrier to entry to sort of partner up with a cashback company. Yeah. Well, it depends how the PLs run, I guess. Like, and and some some brands will put no budget against it and say it's un like as long as we're running within these efficiencies scale, and um they're they're brands that tend to do really well because they they um they they've set their 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 commission level and therefore their cashback rate, and they they can opt into promotions and different campaigns we run, and just go go hell for leather because they're working on a return on ad spend. Whereas other businesses run their P&Ls differently where there's, you know, a hard cap on the marketing budget and the therefore a cap on each channel within that budget. And so we, t- we tend to manage those, those budgets um, more tightly for the merchants um, given their goals internally. But I mean, like a good example is that Shopback, you know, if, if I can get Meta to scale at a, at a set CPA, we will continue to invest in that channel like at, at no with i mean there'll be a limit but we'll 10x the budget as long as it's within the efficiencies because we know it's we the the customer the seal the CLV or the customer lifetime value of the customer is predictable so we know that we're going to earn the 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 cost of acquisition back within a set very set set and strict time frame so it makes sense like if that, if all those things are true then why not continue in, to invest uh, in, in that specific channel. Interesting. So I guess to make it more understandable, even to me, let's use the teeth whitening kit example. Let's say the AOV is $40. We purchase each, the cost of goods for each unit is only $5. So we have a profit margin of, let's say, I don't know how much is that? It's like 75%, 70, 65%. So that means we know we can comfortably give you guys 30% commission on every sale that you guys bring through mm-hmm. and there's no limit uh, i could t- we can you can just pump the brakes i could give you 30 percent for as many orders you come in because um we're still making profit with every single sale so one there doesn't seem to be a barrier like that we don't have to fork any upfront investment there isn't any risk it's risk-free for the merchant and two technically the sky's the limit or am i missing something here no, sky, sky's the limit. And and the other, the other um, we can break this down even further, which is that's on a cost per, that's on a unit basis. So you're saying you've got, you know, 75% margin and you want to give 30% like commission away. So that you're at a, at a um, cost per sale, you're, you're profitable. The other way you can look at it is of all the orders that someone like Shopback brings you, how many of those orders are from true new customers? Someone who's never shopped from you before. And then you can say, okay, to find a new customer in other channels, even like a blended acquisition cost, my blended acquisition cost is this. The Shopback's bringing it in at that. 
So you might even say because of the new to existing customer ratio, you might want to overinvest because you're bringing new customers in, you'll know what your retention rates or repurchase rates are like. So then it's quite, you can kind of extrapolate out the math and say, I can spend this much to acquire a customer because I know within three orders or six months, whatever, which are, however you track it, within that that time scale, they're going to purchase enough. I'm going to earn enough margin for them to be um, to pay back my initial marketing investment to acquire. So I think there's yeah. If you, I mean the first the example you gave at the start was probably more of a return on ad spend um, or a, or just on a, a per a per sale basis. But then the really the people that use the channel um, well and look at the results and optimize well are the ones that go, okay, I've had 100, 100 customers buy, 30, 30 of those customers were new customers. Oh, 20 of those people bought from me 12 months ago but haven't bought before, haven't since bought. So then I've got 50, which are technically new it's new customers acquired and the other 50 uh, uh, you know people that have bought within the last 12 months but it's still within my margins so you can get very um scientific in the way that you track results and then optimize your spend towards that very interesting so when you talk about merchants that use your platform well does that mean you guys have a bidding system like can people play around with the numbers and if people have more data, they can offer higher commissions and that would bump them up in the listings. Is there like a bidding system or, or what did you mean by that? Uh, it's not so much like a, like a, um, an SEM, like it's not, not like a cost per click bidding system. I, I think we, cause we, what we need to be mindful of is things like seasonality, um, things like category, uh, you know, customers want to buy different things at different times of the year and we still want to retain control on our platform or, you know, we want to be able to show our customers what we know our customers are after. And at the same time, we need to balance out, you know, um, the demand side, which uh, so the supply side, which is giving merchants the opportunity to, to buy into campaigns. So it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's an automated uh, algorithm that controls that. It's our team here that, um, set up a campaign structure and you know, essentially you know how many placements you have to offer and uh, we know the value of those placements and we go out and speak to brands who we think would fit the the campaign thematics and and ones that customers will, will likely want to buy from. Got it. So if we go back to the teeth widening example, I guess let's say in the scenario you guys don't know our profit margins, but let's say we were to approach you in three different scenarios. Scenario one, we say, hey, we'll give you 30% commission and we confidently can do that because we know we're going to make profit. Scenario two, we come to him like, hey, we're willing to give you 50% commission. We're confident we'll break even on the initial sale. So we sort of ish can do it, but it's a bit more uncomfortable. In scenario three, we come to him like, hey, we could give you your shop back users a whopping 65% off commission. And we know that over two years, the lifetime value of a customer would make that money back. I guess if I if we approached you in those three scenarios, would scenario one be something you guys would just outwardly reject? Like, hey, this is not worth our time. Is there any benefit to just go go on to option three and be like, hey, like sort of like go to the max? Or, or how does it usually work? Is it a negotiation? Do you guys come to the merchants with a percentage? And how do you guys do if you don't know the margins for the merchant? Mm. I'd say for like for a new brand. So there's two 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 scenarios here. If the teeth whitening brand was new, we'd want to speak to them in the outset about what are their goals. You know, what are what are they trying to achieve through this channel? The three goals generally are: I want to drive revenue, I want to find new customers, and I want to retain old or bring back lapsed customers. They're kind of like the three buckets. And so, in the in the case of us not knowing, you know, where the limits are or what the goals are, we definitely want to have a conversation about that and sort of and understand where we where we can both play. So I think that that kind of then answers that one. But for existing brands, historically, we know we've had the conversation, we've worked with them for, you know, some brands we've been online with for six years in Australia. We know exactly where their their um, their goals are and, and 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 kind of I guess where the math needs to sit. So we can go back and just propose like, hey, you know, if if this this kind of exposure um, is, we'd like to see that. If for this, we'd like to see the, this cashback rate. And then it's more or less like think about it more of a part more. It's it's all of 
it is all partnership and zero algorithm. And that's that's one of the most important things is that we want to grow in a sustainable way. Um, we want our brands to grow sustainably on sh- in Shopback. We don't want to, you know, put them in a position where they're running like really, really negatively geared campaigns and running down budgets because at the end of the day, they're just going to have to turn off and that's not in anyone's interest. So it does come down to it being a, a really strong partnership where we figure out where the tolerances are, what exposures they want. We match the two up. We present that to customers. God, are you guys at a place where you guys are having to choose the merchants you work with? For example, let's say a teeth whitening kit company comes to you and a pimple vacuum company comes to you. Are you having to pick which one is sort of more valuable of a merchant or do you just onboard both? Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we, on, we onboard both. I, I, the the principles of a marketplace uh, like on the supply side is quite easy. Like it's the widest selection. So we want to have, we want customers to be able to come find their favorite brands, find new brands to shop from within the shop back platform. And so beyond categories that are prohibited or ones that we don't align with our company's values, then we welcome all merchants to come on board. And I think that the way, like the, we're kind of talking about the barrier to entry before, you know, some merchants prefer to integrate directly with us. And if they're at scale, then we would, you know, integrate our technologies together. But some merchants are at a much smaller scale and want to get get the most out of the affiliate channel. So it might make sense for them to go to a technology partner or a network, like the four I mentioned before, so that they can integrate once into a, a an affiliate network and then they get the breadth of the uh, affiliate channel and and we're already integrated with those networks so it's quite an easy it's quite an easy uh, process to get live on shopback once that occurs interesting would you guys be similar to something like eBay then where anyone can list a product on eBay for free get reach for free but upon your purchase your product being sold eBay takes say 12% Yep. Is that like a one-to-one comparison to what you guys do? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good comparison because you, you, you list on eBay, you list your store on eBay. And I'm assuming, I don't know the economics of eBay, but uh, yeah, for sure, they're going to take a, a, a clip of the, um, that's where at that point, the cost per sale model comes in. List, customer finds you, they make a transaction um, and eBay takes a commission off that transaction. It's the same as Shopback, exactly the same, which is why it's such a powerful marketing tool for marketers because the predictability of the cost is fixed. Like there's no, there's nothing unpredictable. You know that the commission rate that you offer Shopback is the, the cost per sale. Whereas, um, as I mentioned before, you know, depending on your creatives or depending on the algorithm or depending on engagement, your cost per impression or click on other platforms is is less predictable, I would say. Interesting. Now, what's your thoughts on like ranking merchants? Like for example, on Amazon, you could do campaigns and it's all about reviews and there's like an algorithm on eBay. Like now they're offering like sort of sponsored listings and you could give them an extra 12% on top of the existing 12% to get bumped to the top. And I guess there's SEO and search. Um, yep. Is that something you guys are thinking about? Is that the future or is that already happening now? Yeah, I'd say we're, we're kind of like in the the midpoint of the the future and happening now. We we have it, it, within our app, it's it's invisible to the eye, but you'll there's different um, components in there that some are manually controlled, some are controlled by one of the three ma- machine learning models, and really those opportunities to you know pa- like bid for placement exist. So we want to give merchants who want to use us as a as a, a platform to raise more awareness um, as well as sales. Those opportunities exist. You know, for example, you could um, buy banners, you could buy placements, you could buy, you know, really tier one positioning like a bought to you by sponsor in one of our major campaigns. At the same time, though, we've got to really balance out a commercial interest with what customers actually want to see. And I think that, you know, the, some of the aforementioned names that you you set, you know, like Amazon and eBay, like I think they do a pretty good job of balancing out commercial interests of the of the entity versus what customers actually want to see. And the last thing you want is to go into an app that's like 
a billboard. There's there's like a, a human see, I believe it was upward of 5,000. The, the, the stat is there. It's like 5,000 marketing messages a day that you're bombarded with. When you come into an app that you want to engage with, the last thing you want to see is irrelevant content and need to really put a lot of thought into trying to find what you're actually trying to find. So we're very deliberate about protecting the customer's interests and balancing that with giving um, brands um, exposure uh, to really kind of raise awareness and, and reach. I love that. Is it possible for brands or small brands to grow on Shopback? Like for example, you see people go from zero to 10 million on Amazon, FBA, Amazon Marketplace. People can go from mm. zero to 10 million using Facebook ads and Shopify. Can an existing brand, maybe they're already making a million a year, let's say their teeth widening kit, could they strategically work with you guys and have you guys be the revenue driver for their company through different campaigns and tweaking things? Or are you guys uh, always just like an extra 10, 20% boost and you guys really can't do those type of multiples on a, on a brand? There's, I mean, theoretically it's possible. You know, um, the, I think that the challenging thing is not challenging, but the, the the important thing to remember is that we work with four and a half thousand brands and, you know, customers are, um, customers want, want to see variety. And so, you know, there, there theoretically is a way that we could work and we do work with brands big and small over a longer period of time to say like, okay, well, you know, how can we, you know, increase your share of category how can we uh, just grow straight, grow your revenue? And so that that's possible, but also like we're, we're one of, you know, you, you wouldn't just do billboards. You wouldn't just do radio. So we're one of, we, we should be used in the marketing mix um, of, of brands and, you know, at a cost per sale model, it's risk-free in the sense that, you know, you're not taking one big bet, taking out like a nationwide uh, drive time, radio slot with Hamish and Andy, you know, doing their, doing what they do well and amplifying brands. Like it, that's a big bet, right? Whereas the, 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 the risk is scaled back when it's at a cost per sale model. So I'd say it's a very healthy place to start and definitely grow in terms of a channel um, in and amongst, you know, a, a variety of other channels that you wanted to, to grow awareness with. Got it. You briefly mentioned sort of brands needing to understand their numbers and i guess like you mentioned commission factory like is commission factory or, or agencies like that like a wrapper for all the different cashback companies there are in australia like is it like say ad like i could go to adwords and i don't know if i can but i can place ads on youtube um, news.com.au forbes are those agencies just a wrapper for all the different is, is that a thing yeah, so maybe um, we can go through the flow. So uh, a, a brand, let's say your tooth, tooth whitening kit, would integrate with um, an agency or a technology partner, who, by the way, we work extremely closely with. So I mentioned kind of, kind of the bigger ones previously, but um, in in your example, let's say the tooth whitening kit com connects with Commission Factory. Then what Commission Factory has is a network, or as do the rest of them, by the way, has a network of publishers that they give the brand access to. And so the brand can go, oh, of these, you know, hundreds of different publishers in Australia, they basically check a box and go, I want to be on this, 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 you know, I want to be on Shopback, I want to be, and, and they can opt into programs. And in many cases, I believe it's kind of, it's really automated. So it's actually a sensible marketing channel to be in. And within those, all those publishers I mentioned, there's blogs, there's price comparison, there's loyalty, uh, there's cashback, there's coupons. There's so many different like modality uh, modalities of, um, of channels. And so they can go and be um, and, and choose, pick and choose, or they can go, I just want to be max, max reach, max exposure. And here's the commission rate I'm happy to afford for each of these different types of publishers. And now some brands will give different types of publishers a different commission rate depending on the value of, of the customers that come through. So some might drive good traffic, poor value customer. So they, you know, uh, once they come in once and they're acquired by the brand through that channel, maybe it's just poor quality traffic and it, and it never comes back. Or perhaps they find a really good cohort within one of the publishers and they go, okay, you know what? Like 
I'm happy to over-index for this publisher because I know that the quality of the customer is high. And going back to our, um, you know, the payback on, on your cost of acquisition might make sense to over-index a bit there because you know that for sure you're going to be paid back within a, uh, you know, a time period or, or an order count that you're happy with. And so, okay, let's over-index a bit there and, and see what else we can do to drive more volume through that channel. Interesting. So is it automated to a point where I can go to like a technology company or an agency and be like, hey, I can offer 10% off my teeth whitening kits and in a month's time, I'll randomly see my brand on say Shopback, on Groupon, on Ozbarga, on coupons and it's all automated and you guys didn't even talk to me and it's somehow just like through technology, just like running an ad on, on AdWords, all of a sudden I'll see my, my brand on scrolling down on Forbes randomly. Possible. Um, yeah, possible. I mean, we do, like I said before, like we do like to have conversations um, where they're required. And some of these networks have account managers inside them. And so the account managers have already chatted to the brand. And basically the account manager's job then is to connect with us, the publisher, to say, you know, here's the different assets. So we, you know, we need like lifestyle imagery. We need uh, offer copy. Um, we need to understand the cashback rates. But I mean, a lot of that can be set up within a system. I think that the, like, it, it can be at the limit, you can scale across all different types of affiliate publishers and all all publishers within those types. Or at the margin, you can kind of go, uh, I want to be ultra selective and I want to speak to these um, publishers about my strategies and whatnot. Now, I think that the, the, the the technologies and our our partners in the agencies do a really good job of, you know, onboarding these clients or these partners um, and and kind of explaining to us where they're at. So, you know, <laughs> to your point around will you randomly appear in Forbes? Like, no, you should not randomly appear on any publisher that you don't opt into, but um, you should be kind of um, confident that the brief that you give will be displayed correctly and your brand's represented in the way that you would expect to be represented and not, um, yeah, and not in any other way. Out of the 4,500 merchants, how much percent of them do you reckon you guys work with directly one-on-one -on -one and they came to you guys directly and how much percent of them are coming through an agency or third party? Mm. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I'd say generally speaking, the bigger the merchant, the more resource they have internally to to manage a program. So, you know, someone like um like let's say booking.com, for example, or or an eBay or a Coslicker group, you know, um, we work with them. They've got affiliate managers or um or an agency that manages their program. Um, whereas Andy's teeth whitening, you know, like hey man, like you might be across four, 400 publishers. Like it's not possible for you to scale yourself across conversations like that. So it really, it, it does depend more so on the, on the, on the merchant and, and what they can, um, how they resource themselves. Yeah. How have these cashback apps gotten really smart where you guys can, the double counting doesn't come in. Like I can't sign up for two cashbacks for Amazon mm -hmm. plus use a coupon or click an affiliate link on a YouTube video, but I have the app on. So that means a YouTuber might somehow get a commission and I'm getting cash back. And then sometimes there's like um, cash back websites where you just click a button and there isn't even a Chrome extension. So how is it differentiating if there's like an extension running at the same time? Like, yeah. Yeah, that, that this is very important for brands is that the the attribution we call it last click attribution so where wherever you click from last is that's the fair thing to say that publisher should be awarded the commission and you know maybe it doesn't matter so much for it would because they've still got to keep the lights on but it might not matter so much for a website or a partner where they don't offer cashback so customers it's invisible the the, the financial relationships invisible to customers. But for us, that's really important because, you know, we promise customers, hey, when you click on anything, uh, uh, you, when you leave shop back, you're going to earn this much cash back, assuming that your item or stay is not cancelled or returned. So it's very, it's a very important nuances or uh, uh, important thing to understand is that attribution is last click. And um, some brands look at attribution differently internally as well and still, you know, reward 
different parts of the funnel. And um, yeah, I think I think for us that that's an important one because a brand who pays, you know, in the instance you gave, like, okay, so I clicked on a, a blog post that was posted in Facebook. So there's two clicks. There's one, two, you're paying a cost per impression to Facebook and then the uh, the blog post partner would be getting a commission. Then you go on to Shopback and, you know, you're, um, uh, you're paying a commission to Shopback. So there needs to be logic to iron that out. I think online it's easy, like, because there's technology um, that prevents stacking or, you know, the other point you raised was codes being used. Some codes can you can use with cashback, some you can't. That's that's at the merchant discretion. I think where it gets really funky is in in the in the in-store reward space where um we we launched because we've been talking about online, I guess, a lot. And at Shopback, we also have in-store cashback as well. And the first instance of that was card linked offers. So you link your card to Shopback. And then when you go and shop from any of our merchant um, partners, let's say, you know, um, uh, Toby's Estate um, or, or any other of our, our merchant partners, all you need to do is just take your credit card, go in, buy your coffee, tap, and then you, you get your coffee, but also you get your cash back, which is great for customers. But the problem is for merchants, the customer is invisible. So they don't know that like, hey, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was busier. And at the same time, it's, like you could think about it like accidental cashback where the customer doesn't even interact with um with the publisher you know you don't go walking around the street looking for coffee and open your app to see where you can get five percent off like it's just not in consumer behavior so what happens is they walk around and they pay 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 with their credit card all around town and they're getting all this accidental cashback which is great for customers but not good for merchants so i think that that's something that we've we've pivoted away from we did a 180 and we're now um, live with QR payments, which are, are a massive thing in Southeast Asia. So, you know, you go to Singapore and every shop front has, you know, upward of five different QR codes from different vendors or they, they're using the, the Singapore QR code, SQR, which is the unified code. There's one code. It's, it's really ingrained in the user behavior. And we believe that there's a space for us to grow that in Australia and try and pioneer that with the pandemic happened and everyone during the pandemic learned how to scan a QR code. And so we're kind of riding off that learnt behavior and saying, hey, like it's not just for checking into a restaurant during COVID, you can actually pay and be rewarded through it as well. Interesting, yeah, on that topic. Yeah, I remember going to a restaurant. I think I went to Papa Rich and I went to Cinnabon yeah. and then I saw the shop back QR code. I was like, oh, cool. Like, and I, I scanned it, paid it on the app. But I guess with that similar thought, I was like, I was going to come here anyways. I didn't know Shopback was here. So like now the restaurant is paying um, a commission on a sale that they would have also gotten without the QR code there. What benefit does it have for a Cinnabon or a restaurant to have that sort of cash back, sort of giving commission away for customers that come in? Yeah, that's a, that's a super question. And one that we... We need to demonstrate a lot is incrementality or not just a lot like we need to be able to demonstrate we're an incremental um sales channel for them and we're less about a you know in the in-store example we're less about a payment method and more about a, like a loyalty proposition for customers and so what happens is that um i'll give you a couple a couple of high level examples so um the the data that we see from customers who use shop back pay is that their average order value is significantly higher than the usual customers that come in and pay through normal payment methods. And the reason for that is that they've accumulated cash back from their booking.com purchase. And so they've got, or, or any other purchase, which is sitting in their shop back account. And now when they go into Papa Rich, they can pay through shop back. And it's kind of like a free transaction for them because they've, they've shot the cash back's just sitting there and they can deploy that for that transaction. Um, now, the thing that would have happened after you shopped at Papa Rich is you're going to start to be retargeted um, on from Shopback to say, hey, like go back to Papa Rich to confirm your cash back. And so we're, we've got this kind of like mechanic built in whereby cust uh, merchants are comfortable to pay us and they're comfortable with our incrementality because of we've got $70 million worth of cash back still in customers' accounts that they can get and that's incremental money that they can get. And then also the mechanics and features that we've built into the loyalty program 
is that customers will be retargeted and reminded that Papa Rich exists and, you know, tr and I think that's one thing like it's lunchtime in Sydney now, you know, what do you do when you go out for lunch? You typically just walk out and try and get what's convenient, quick and close. But if we can remind you that, you know, hey, this merchant exists and you've shopped there before and you can earn cash back by going back, I think it's pretty powerful to try and to steal, you know, get mind share and wallet share. When I go to Papa Rich and I scan the QR code, is there a difference for the merchant if I choose to pay with my sort of card versus pay using shop back credits I have? Uh, difference. There's no no difference at all. As far as they're concerned, they're just getting a, a transaction, a confirmed transaction through. So um, the, the difference really is, I'll go back to it, like from a merchant standpoint, it's a shop back transaction. And then they can see like the attribution is clear. Like you've got a, a, a customer standing there and scanning a QR code and saying, I've paid with shop back and they display their, their shop back and the little, we've got a device in store that pings. So it lets them know that the, the transaction's through. So it's a, it's a good experience and we're working with merchants now to integrate into their point of sale so that it's a more frictionless transaction. And I think that's really important, especially in the F&B industry, to make sure that you're getting customers moving through your store quickly and, you know, you get them served and on to the next. But the most, the, the biggest upside is for customers when you think about, you know, you can shop online in store or buy gift cards from Shopback. We've created this kind of flywheel of, um, you can earn cash back and then you can spend that cash back and buy gift cards or you can spend that cash back and spend it in store. And it starts to become quite a closed loop, like a strong closed loop um, loyalty program, not just for us and our customers, but for our merchants as well, as the money that customers have earned from different merchants is, is then spent in, in future transactions. Is there a difference how the money flows for an online merchant versus in-store merchant? Because for example, with an online merchant, I'll buy something off Amazon, Amazon gets the money, and I guess then they sort of fork off the commission to you guys. But with the Papa Rich example, I guess the money goes to shop back first, and then you guys then send Papa Rich the money. Is that how it works? Oh, cool. Yeah, correct. And I think that that's, that's a really easy way for, especially for in-store merchants is that, you know, the alternative is that if we're, if, if we're, if we don't settle with directly with them, then, you know, um, like they do with card linked offers, a bill gets sent to them, the bill goes through to their accounts uh, payable, it gets checked and questioned. And it's, it's actually a, a much more seamless relationship financially, I would say with the merchant. And yeah, for your, in your online example, it's uh, yeah. I mean, we we all we are is a, a traffic. We we're, we we drive traffic, and um, as a as a affiliate partner for them, the merchant to to handle the the uh, the customers' needs from there. Got it. And with the in-store merchants, would you guys be paying out as quickly as Visa, Amex? Would it be faster, slower? Is this lower cash flow? Yeah. So it, it's I, I think like the what you're talking about there is settlement period. And where we like benchmarking off a um, uh, like a visa or, or or a bank is is always hard to beat, right? Like they're big institutions, um, and so I think we benchmark off players like us in our space, which is you know like any food delivery um, players or or alike. We we make sure that we're we're getting our merchants their money as quickly as possible, which is twice or three times a week. Interesting. Yeah, you talk about food delivery. Now I'm thinking about. Uber Eats and Uber Eats is a very, very similar model. And I'm seeing so many parallels in, in this 15 seconds that you just brought it up. Is that a space that you guys would want to get into? Like integrate Uber Eats into ShopPack? <laughs> I mean, wow. Uber, Uber Eats is, you can earn cash back when you shop through Uber Eats on ShopPack um, on, uh, on on online, but and we sell their gift cards as well. But I think like, is your question more, are we ever thinking about becoming a delivery player? Yeah, now thinking about it, yeah, it's hard because Uber Eats works because they own the delivery system and they have drivers. Whereas if, even if you guys listed a bunch of restaurants on your app and people purchased it, you would have to partner up with like a delivery system probably, yeah. We're, we're very clear on what our value proposition is, which is to make shopping rewarding and delightful. And I think the operative word there is shopping. And so like, I, I don't think we want to get into the the delivery fulfillment last mile space. Um, 
yeah, I mean, it seems to be a high barrier to entry around, you know, like the the amount of cash that it takes to to build up the infrastructure and it's it's unless you partner, of course. But yeah, no, I, I think going back to why we exist is the most important thing, which is, you know, giving customers rewarding experiences, where, whether they're shopping online or in store or, um, yeah, for gift cards. Does that mean Uber Eats is sort of making money both on the last mile delivery fee plus they're probably getting a commission on sales they generate for these restaurants so they're they're getting paid twice is that the case i i don't know i i I, it's a funny story actually i live in an area that believe it or not in sydney there's areas where uber eats or menu log or doordash they just don't go to and so like i i can't tell you when my last uber eats order was um i live on the hawkesbury outside outside of sydney and not even Domino's exists there. Um, so I haven't used a delivery app and I'm not sure at what level their fees are today, but I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. Yeah, I think that's sort of why I saw that one-to-one metaphor because they sort of traffic, a, they, they store a bunch of merchants and they probably, how the merchants rank, it's very similar to Shopback, but the only difference is they also have the delivery sector. But So they're basically running two businesses in one it looks like yeah yeah definitely and and like i i'd imagine like it's not cheap to run a, a last mile business right like you you can see that others have tried and and not succeeded in this market whether it be population density or you know just how how big the country is itself and so the the economies of scale don't quite stack up but the, there's two different user intents you know it's the same like there's there's apps that allow you to order ahead when you go to a restaurant um, we don't really even see them as competitors, really, because your your intent is different. So with Shopback, you know, you're going in, um, uh, you can you can sit in, or you can even take away, but and and you're and you're paying in the moment and earning cash back. Whereas others, it's like okay, so delivery, so you, you just you can't make it to the venue, or you want the venue to come to you, like you're not going to ever use Shopback. So we don't we don't see a clash in terms of competitive space there. It's more like. What are the needs of the customer in that moment? And, you know, do they need ultimate convenience or are they are they really going in, in store themselves? Yeah. One thing that you did brought, brought up before was like the flywheel effect and economy of scales. Um, how have you guys utilized that? And, and I guess thinking about it briefly, if someone learns how to use Shopback, now they're going to consistently use it. And if you have consistent users using your platform, it's very lucrative for the merchant to work with you guys. And with more merchants, I guess there's more options for customers and that brings leads to more customers. Is that usually the flywheel effect? Yeah, it's interesting. We sat down as a leadership team and we tried to articulate exactly what our flywheel was. And if you Google Amazon flywheel, you'll see that they've clearly articulated it, which is around pricing, um, around uh, uh, you know, widest product choice. And then in between there, they've got um, things around you know, like building technologies and, and and fast delivery, which is their flywheel, right? They get more customers, they get better pricing from their merchants, they get more customers, which then gives their merchants more scale and the wheel flies, and then they've got an accelerator. So I think that like what, whilst, whilst the leadership team has different views on what our flywheel is, they kind of converge into the same. And that would be that we want to give um, the widest range possible, which is a marketplace strategy. Um, we want to have um, re- reliable and scalable technology. Um, and when things go wrong, like customer service, we want we want that to be something that um, customers can lean on. And if we've got the widest range, the best products and the best service, that will help us scale customers. And then we become more valuable to our merchants. And so that flywheel comes in. And then where I believe our accelerator is, is when we're able to give customers more utility to spend their cash back the way they want to spend it. So some might want to withdraw their cash back to a bank account and you know and save it for an extra night or two away on holidays or dinner with friends. Some some people might want to convert it into a Amazon gift card and spend it on Prime Day. Some some people might want to turn their you know forty dollars Booking dot com cash back into ten coffees at their local favorite. So this kind of like stickiness and utility in in the way that you can spend and earn and, and spend your cash back is a really strong accelerator with respect to customer retention as well. Yeah. If we look at like Amazon and Woolworths, they get so much traffic and so many customers that they can sort of pressure suppliers to sort of 
get the prices as low as possible so that customers can get amazing products at the lowest prices and the manufacturers or the suppliers have to comply because if they're not in Woolworths, if they're not on Amazon, they're going to sort of die. But I guess in the cashback space, even if you guys have a ton of traffic, there's nothing forcing a merchant to stay with you guys. They can go somewhere else or they might not even, they can just stop doing affiliate marketing. So Amazon and Woolworths has cr like built this crazy moat that keeps suppliers locked in. Um, do you have any sort of barriers or moats that sort of have a similar effect? Mm. Um, I, I won't, I, I probably won't comment on the Amazon Woolworth strategies, but what I would comment on is that we like it, it, a, a merchant, there's no, like, like you said, they can ultimately just say, I don't want to do affiliate anymore. And that's totally fine, but it's not in our interest. We want to, we want to going back to why, what on our marketplace strategy of the widest choice is we want to make sure that merchants are comfortable with like the the commissions that they're paying. And if they're comfortable with the commissions they're paying and the performance, then there, there's no reason for them to leave. And so I think that that's one of our, our strategies is to get super close to merchants and understand what it is they're looking for and, and you know, their, the efficiencies they want from the channel, create really strong marketing campaigns and reasons to use Shopback. Like for example, beyond just Black Friday, Cyber Monday, we do like influencer campaigns where we partner up with brands and um, we, we've we got um, an influencer team in-house in that can get influencers to shout out about specific brands or we can like have a collab, a three-way co collab where we partner um, a brand with an influencer. They talk about um, certain things and then uh, the influencer talks about the brand and then um, ultimately the traffic comes back through Shopback. So there's a number of reasons and ways we try not to be one dimensional. It's multi-dimensional and, um, and working with brands as a partner, as opposed to perhaps um, having more, uh, having a different approach. Yeah. That's so cool. You mentioned marketing. Tell me a bit about the marketing. Like over the last year, I've been seeing these ads on TikTok on these young influencers that are like, Hey, do you want to get paid for shopping online? And I've been seeing more and more of these ads. Are these just sort of brand sort of, campaigns do you guys is there like a value per customer like yeah like is there a value per user like do you know the value of a user like how does facebook know the value of one of their billions user i guess they can is it based on well i guess on facebook if i'm scrolling and seeing 50 posts a day they can i guess see how many how long it will take for me to to see a thousand posts and like i guess they can see the cpm and i guess maybe that's how they find the value of a user um yeah tell me a bit about the marketing strategy yeah i, I i'm not sure how it relates to like let's say platform usage on facebook that wouldn't give me personally any indication of what kind of level of um profitability this customer might be if we if we you know acquire with them and give them a really good experience and they stay with us for a long period of time the thing that we might mostly look for is like let, let me zoom out a bit on the marketing front the mark from a marketing standpoint like we like to have a ton of fun and experiment with what we're doing and i think it doesn't matter it's kind of like channel agnostic um with that in mind so like on paid social um to your point more just then about profitability of customers, we're running tests and learns across multiple different um, campaigns and creative sets, um, different variations. We're testing and learning with, you know, green screen uh, versus like in-house content versus AI content. So there's like a lot of tests and learns. And what we can do is we can kind of pinpoint that this creative, um, you know, on this platform, i.e. like this uh, green screen of, of Andy, explaining you know booking.com performs really really well on meta and it's generating the right cohort of customers and so we'll figure out then okay so like what variations of andy on a green screen can we do to then like broaden the the audience interest or 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 just scale this this particular ad set so like the test and learn thing is like is a is a weekly thing and then obviously like from a, a team brainstorming point of view and then daily thing for the guys that are actually in there buying and bidding but then across other channels, like we've done some whack stuff. So like I'll give you an example. We had um, from an activation point of view, public activation point of view, we um, we put, we thought about like, what is the value proposition of Shopback? It, it's cashback. So how can we give customers in the real world the feeling of earning cashback? 
So we built this life-sized um, snow globe, which then we filled full of cash and prizes. So it was about 40 grand worth of cash and prizes, not actual cash, but like shop back dollars in there. And we put it up in Martin Place and we had something like 2,000 um, people in Martin Place go into the snow globe and then for 30 seconds grab all the cash and prizes. And then when they got out the other side, we uploaded it to their shop back account. And so it was really interesting because you got to go down and speak directly to customers, understand, like say like, hey, this is shop back. This is the app. What do you think? Um, do you like it? What don't you like? How might we be different? Um, how can we make it more obvious for the for for what we do? And then aside from that, one to one convos that are so important, especially when you're a young company, because you like, if you sit behind the screen and you just look at click streams or click click share or you know output metrics like revenue and margin, like you're never actually going to understand what it is that customers want. And I've personally found the best way is when we started shop back in Australia. I set up an auto email that was sent to every single person that signed up to shop back. Just like, Hey, my name's Gus, co-founder of shop back. Um, thanks for being an early adopter. Like, let me know. I'm here if you want any feedback. And actually the open rates on those were enormous because it's, it's a personalized message. And then the feedback we got from it was like invaluable because it was like, Hey, I love shop back, but can you do this? Or what have you ever thought about that? Um, I've, my first transaction didn't work. Like all of these things that would is either saving a customer from um, being lost or or finding out actually, you know, what it is they really want to see us grow into was so invaluable in the early stage. And of course, we've automated and, and scaled this now to um, a more scalable process. But whether it's those emails welcoming customers or the snow globe, or even if you go and sit down in a cafe and walk around and just say to guys like, hey, you know, like customers in a cafe are very receptive if they're waiting in line for their coffee to give you some like brutal, honest feedback that as a startup, it's like you could pay focus groups and someone to monitor those focus groups and give you a detailed report, but they're not the founder. They're not operating. Like they don't intuitively know when a customer says X that they might mean Y and, you know, clarify in the moment. So I think, I think that that, that was really powerful and, you know, from a you know, activation standpoint and being creative, but then also then just trying to, you know, once we've got customers or even reaching out to potential customers in real life and just kind of saying like, what do you want from us? I mean, the only, the, the other example I give in the marketing standpoint was this is actually really early on and we learned a few lessons around Facebook live functionality was for our birthday. It was our second birthday and we, we're a team of seven in Australia um, and we we basically dressed up the whole team as clowns and we went to a studio and did a Facebook Live and the clowns were playing games through the... Fa the idea was the clowns would play games through the Facebook Live and like hold up a Jenga item and there'd be a code on there and then it was like fastest fingers for customers to go into our app, punch in the code, redeem and then get uh, cash back. So we promoted this like for weeks right like teased it out shop back to be cash back giveaway it's a clown game you know join the facebook live we had something like five thousand people rsvp for the facebook live now on the day things didn't go well what, what happened was that we learned that facebook's live is not live for everyone what i mean by that is if you and i were watching a facebook live video there's going to be a delay and so some customers um were seeing a delayed um uh, delayed screen and so then when they were trying to redeem codes, they were like fully redeemed. Then actually it got so popular that our app couldn't handle the traffic and crashed. And then customers are like, oh, this is, this is not good. And then Facebook reported us to Facebook and then live shut down. And so we were all in the office like, oh my God, we've just, this is such a great idea, but it went awry because we didn't factor these things in. And then on the other side of the camera at the same time, half the staff are still dressed as clowns and, display it's still doing the the promo and so we quickly had to then spin it and be like okay that was not good how do we recover this and um, we managed to pull together a an email which the title subject line was we're not clowning around anymore which is like like a very witty way to and then it opens up with an apology and then we had a, me a different mechanic that really satisfied and built trust back in customers in the moment but I think that that was one learning for me was like test rigorously platforms before you do things and 
you know, in the early days when you're a team of seven, you move really quick and um, that's the right thing to do. And you still, as a bigger team now, we still have that move fast mentality. We try like, we try to break less things, but at the same time, you know, if, if you're not breaking things like, you know, are we pushing to the limit? Um, so, yeah, I think that that was like another, well, let's bring back memories, but that, that was like another interesting and beyond just doing, you know, performance marketing or programmatic, like how can you actually get out and engage customers? Also not just through influencers, which is a great channel, but how can you create meaningful marketing moments where customers actually see who you are as a brand and really buy into the story beyond the value proposition that you give, which is like cashback, you know, um, can you give them an experience that that resonates and, and is memorable and cuts through? That's that's kind of our philosophy there. When you guys sent out that email after the live crashed, um, what was that mechanic that you guys created? Like how did you replicate the showing of the code and if they redeem it, pass the finger, how did you recreate that on the email? Yeah, so, th so that one, we, we just went straight with like, what instead of trying to create recreate a mechanic that um for a give like some kind of mechanic that that uh the customers would in, try and engage with we just went with the approach of you know what we stuffed up we're sorry and the mechanic then was that all you had to do was click a button and you would go into the chance to win x amount i can't remember the exact dollar value but it was like x amount of prizes to this dollar value so it was kind of like almost flipping it on its head and going, well, that was intense. You know what? Just press this button. We'll put you in the drawer. And and, and um, I think having a bit of fun with it as well, like in the subject line and the creative around, not clowning around. And, you know, that that was kind of the intention there. And, um, yeah, like a, a really good lesson in, like, at the time I was in Malaysia, in our Malaysian office, watching this, like, this this unfold where it was like, you know, we're, we're slacking on the side going, oh, this is really great. And then someone says, oh, no, but wait, the code, the, the 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 Facebook's delayed. And then someone's like, oh, the app's down. And then as I was watching on this screen, the Facebook just went, the live broadcast has ended. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> what? Okay, let's get on the phone. Let's problem solve. Let's figure out the recovery and um, get that out to customers as quickly as possible. And uh, yeah, learn from it. It's these kind of war stories that I think making working in startups fun is you kind of, you you got i mean aside from the the really like serious things that can go wrong these kind of things right like customers got a laugh out of it in the end and you know i think i think we were able to make good in and um the people who dressed up as clowns my team that who, who dressed up as clowns haven't quite forgiven us yet for the experience but you know we <laughs> you can't enjoy your job a hundred percent can you <laughs> that's pretty cool so like um yeah, like that was, I guess, five years ago. So you guys seem to have like a really solid retention on employees. Nowadays, in today's space, it feels like everyone, all my peers are jumping companies every two, three years. How have you guys kept such a great retention rate on, on team members? Yeah, I, I think it's this is something that's really near and dear to my heart, which is when we were four people in an Airbnb in Sydney, we hired early we hired really strong so we we hired people that were you know okay with a no job description or a very like very very wide job description and so they kind of like you know jack of all trades um uh, multifaceted kind of skill set but most importantly they had like the right behaviors that aligned very clearly with our company values and for us, we believe that a company value is like that beyond something that a statement or a bunch of words that's written on the wall, they actually, if done well, they then serve as the behavior benchmark for, for employees, which I think then sets the culture. Like for me, culture is not coffee machines. It's not like bring your dog to work day. It's not, you know, like a canteen in the office. Those things are nice, but like if all of those things solve uh, retention problems then would google have a retention problem would facebook have a retention problem like they're, they're not like throwing money like you cannot buy retention you cannot buy engagement and so it shot back um from hiring early hiring well early it really set the tone for um anyone else that came in afterwards around how we behave how we show up how we act um you know how we treat each other and it allowed our our culture to scale and to a point where it is today and it's true. If you go to Shopback 
Korea or shot back Germany or shot back Thailand, they're very similar, if not identical um, behaviors that you see in the office. Of course, the people are different. Diversity is amazing. We like to see different people from races and religions and beliefs come in and add their own flavor. But at the same time, we have an unwavering bar when it comes to the behaviors that we expect to see. And that that is, it's something really magic. I think when you get that right is you got people that want to come to work because they've got people with like-minded um, or they see people behaving similarly and coming in and putting in their best and driving outcomes. It's actually quite an engaging place to want to work. And I think that, I think that that's something that we've done really well was hire strong, hire against a clear set of values and go into conversations around how do we increase uh, staff engagement, not with how do we buy it, but how do we, what can we create that will help people to see that this is a wonderful place to get started in their career, a wonderful place to grow their career, uh, a wonderful place to be challenged and, you know, rewarded for high performance. Interesting. What behaviors or values did you guys optimize for during that initial hiring period of the first 10 people and were you guys paying like 30 percent above market value for a players what was the strategy at that time yeah no i I think like the without going into the nuances of our remuneration policies like you know when we don't pay the best we don't pay the worst and and you know um i think that we would like to reward fairly is um is the key kind of objective that we have when it comes to like the early early stage i'd say you know whether they're like in the, the first three employees or the next 50, what, what I really look for is very similar. It's, you know, do they like, and the reason why I look for this is because like I personally, I'm sure you would as well, right? You get energized around people that are like enthusiastic, that are motivated, that have like grit and determination, kind of like, I want to say ethic, like not like ethic as in like, they've got good work, work ethic and they turn up and they do their work nine to five or whatever. But like ethic is in like how they show up, the standards that they're willing to accept. These kind of things I think you can test in in, uh, to a certain degree in in interviews. And so beyond our company values, I'd say they're they're the things that I really looked out for and um, over-indexed on. Or even like, I mean, aside from let's say you need to hire a lawyer, you need to hire a data scientist or a software engineer. Okay, like the the skills required for those roles, they're quite technical. Um, so you maybe would index away from where I'm going to say I'm indexing for sales, marketing, and operations roles is I, I index more so without, aside from it being a technical role, more so on the behaviors, and um, aside and then then you know the the hard skills that this person should have in the role, and they can like if we do a good job, we should be able to teach them if they've got the the um the dexterity and like the ability to learn then we can teach them um, but what we can't teach is uh, attitude um determination like the grit factor that i was or the the ethic factor that i was kind of speaking about before during an interview how do you guys test for um ethical behavior attitude um and, and i guess know that it's not like a interview sort of buff up but it's yep. sort of that person. That's a good one. So, I mean, beyond the the normal, like, I shouldn't say, shouldn't say normal because, I mean, everyone interviews differently. Um, the, the, at one extreme, you've got the Amazon interview process, right, where you've got very determined and set roles for each and every stage um, of the interview process. You've got different people coming in for different reasons. And it's actually, like, I'd say almost the gold standard when it comes to recruitment, um, in-house recruitment. Um, at Shopback, you know, we have like a very rigorous process. One of the parts to your point around how do we t- how do we test for these kind of qualities that I've been talking about is that we um, we test it against our values. So, like, I'm not trying to come up with Gus's own, you know, criteria for hiring. We need to be able to scale that across the business and say, you know, to hire to to pass interviews at Shopback, we want to see you clearly demonstrate examples against our company values. Things like succeeding as one, which is kind of like teamwork. Things like honoring customers, which talks about being obsessed with customers. 
talking about uh, things like keeping it real, which is being able to accept and give honest and clear feedback at all times. So during the interview, I'd love to hear a candidate um, give me examples. And if not, I'll try and find examples in their previous experience against these values so that we can know that they've got the traits that we need for us to succeed. And I guess, um, is that through just asking questions for, hey, can you please share a previous case study of you, you asking for help? Is it through questions like that? Yeah, I, I try not to like, okay, so if I said to you, what do you reckon the top three most popular interview questions are, I bet you could rattle them off, right? Tell me a time that you were challenged or tell me a time that you had to deal with conflict in the workplace. Okay, they're good starting points, but I think if you're able to kind of spin it a bit, then you can... Um, like for me, I'll give you an example. Instead of saying like, what are your three greatest weaknesses or what, what are your weaknesses? I like to say, tell me, give me a time, uh, most, give me a recent example of critical feedback that you've received and how have you learned and changed from that? And so it makes them think it's re rewrapping the, what are your weaknesses? Because if they've got feedback on it, then obviously there, there, there may be room for improvement. So if they can come up with like critical feedback that they have received in the past, that they've then been able to listen to it. And most importantly, not just listen to it, but actually turn it turn it into a, a forward step, like an action. And they've learned from it and they've grown from it. That's that's awesome because then you could, you've got someone who can accept feedback at a surface level, someone who can accept feedback, who's emotionally aware enough to go, actually, you know what, that's something I can change, make a change, like implementing feedback or implementing knowledge and then being able to talk about how that then changed, like that's quite a powerful thing. And that that's just one example. So yeah, I kind of, um, I don't know if you've heard, there's a really, I, I'm not, I can't remember which billionaire it is, but I remember reading in a, that made me Branson that if um, at an interview, what they do is they walk through, um, go and greet them at the front door and then they'll walk the candidate through to the, to the, the pantry or the kitchen in the office and offer them a beverage. And so the person knows where the kitchen is. So they they get their, their water and they go to the interview. They sit down, they do the interview. Now, if they get up and offer to or take the cup back, that that told that interviewer that this person, you know, picks up after themselves. They're not going to um, yeah, they're not they're not gonna leave stuff around. And they've kind of got that care factor that's really hard to test in an oral exam exam. Whereas if they if they if they leave the cup there, then they just walk out like, okay, they might be nervous, granted, but someone who's at a high bar who really cares about the impression they leave and they know where that cup should go, then, hey, like maybe they should take it away. So I think that that's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like live or die by this one, but it's an interesting take on um, signals that you can get without the person, without, without asking the person. I love that. Do you still do each and every interview for every new employee that comes through or does a HR sort of team do it? Uh, so we have, no, I, the truth is it's very hard to, as, at scale, to meet everyone. I think where I come in is I can offer perspectives if, um, you know, after the, the hiring manager, so the person who this candidate will be reporting to will do the interview round. Then we have a case study round, which is actually just more or less to see how the person thinks. The hiring manager will bring a partner into that. And so that there's two people who can kind of objectively think about how the candidate's suitability is. And it's actually very easy. Like once you've got two people in the room, then your mind isn't on recording the information, like recording your thoughts and then thinking about the next question and trying to see body language and assess them in nonverbal ways. You've got a partner there that can, while they're asking questions, you can kind of sit back and go, Huh, okay, like what else can I read from these um, verbal or nonverbal cues that I'm getting from this candidate? So I think that, that the two-person interview at the second stage is really important. I'll come in if there's um, a culture check required. I'll come in if it's a senior position. Um, if they report to me, of course, I'm there through the whole period or through the whole process as well. Um, and that goes for, you know, international candidates too. So, you know, if we're hiring for senior folks in different markets, um, I might come in to add my perspectives as as um, someone who's been operating at Shopback for a while. Yeah, I think, I don't know if it was Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, but they were just determined on doing like every last stage interview before each employee got employed for like as long as possible. And obviously it wasn't scalable and they had to sort of let 
the reins go and entrust someone to to be able to read people on their behalf yeah and i guess how big is shop back now and how much percent of people that come through do you think you've played like an interview role with and um, i guess the rest would be your your amazing team yeah i look i'd say that um maybe i can just go back to the point you were raising about steve jobs um and others that want to try and be there even if if not like only at the last stage but at some stages like I, th I think that that gets to a point where it's obviously not going to be scalable and so the 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 job then you need to do is kind of bottle up how you would expect like bottle up the process and and scale it so like formulate it and scale the process and i think that the amazon do it quite well where they have <clears throat> the process and then they also have what's called the bar raiser but is always involved and the, at least last time I read, have you read uh, Working Backwards? I have not. Very, very, very good book on it. It's basically written by ex-Amazon guys and um, all about the Amazon process and like different aspects of the business. But the, 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 the recruitment side really spiked my interest because this theory of a bar raiser is that you have multiple bar raisers in the company and they've all been trained to a higher level than the hiring managers on interview process, bias identification and they actually have the ultimate say to hire or not and so like we we don't do we don't have that but we do have similar like a, a like a kind of similar functions i would say so um you know for high stakes roles that we hire there's always panels that um we get a whole range of different perspectives and ultimately it's the hiring manager's choice um because you want to empower them but you definitely want to get as many especially for like a a, a senior hire, you want to be able to get as many perspectives as possible so that your blind spots or unconscious, unconscious biases are checked, I would say. Yeah, like to your question, like the Shopback group, we're, we're at 600 odd people today. And um, I've like in Australia, um, I've personally in the early state, like right up until, I don't know, a year or two ago, I was a part of every interview process but I'll be a part of a culture check. But I, I think the important part that founders can play is in the day one induction of new joiners. So once once they've passed the interview stage, then you know when you when you walk into a new job, you walk in, they go, "Here's your laptop. Here's some you know, some company merch. Here's the the office tour," and you get to know everyone. But the most important thing, the most important thing during that first day all the way out to the the 14th day is setting the pace and expectations right and early. And I would say that um, founders can um, have like, if the, if, if the inductions are run on a, a fortnightly or a monthly basis, the value that a founder brings by bring, being in that first meeting of the day to explain who they are, what the business is, what they hope, what their goals are for the business, what the vision is, it's so impactful and it's definitely worth their time and, and effort to do that. And I would say that that's important, but then the first 14 days, like we have this kind of theory, like we don't, when it's, it's, we're all adults. It's not a kiddies pool. You know, we shouldn't set them up over the first 14 days just with a checkbox and a, and a, a, a learning curriculum to self learn and kind of go at their own pace. Like I don't, I, put, I don't want to go into a job like that. I want to be challenged from day one, you know, like, show me show me the hard stuff and let me learn and so we like to have this no kiddies pool kind of view of let's let's um bring them up to speed as quickly as possible and show them the pace in which we operate the intensity that we operate and i'm not saying it's long hours it's just like you know we work at at a level of intensity and pace that um if if that's shown over the first two weeks then it sets them up well um for the for their rest of their employment i love that are there any surprisingly high ROI activities when it comes to sort of employment engagement, whether it's like a yearly sort of team party or like a coffee machine or um, having a sort of open door policy where people are actually doing one-on-ones with the CEO? Have there been any surprisingly high ROI retention uh, things? Interesting question. I, I, I think it depends on the individual, I would say. Like the end of your trip could be fun for anyone without kids but then like anyone with kids then they've got to like 
oh, wow, I've got to plan a babysitter. I've got to figure out what my partner's doing for work or maybe I'm alone and I need someone to like, there's that kind of creates a bit of stress. And I've learned that as I've got two kids now, I'm like, what I used to like and value in a workplace is different to what I like and value today with respect to engagement. So I think it's the, the, the what we try and do is try and tick as um, many, uh, try, try and tick, like do le doing less is more in this circuit, in this instance. So we, we figure out what we think, what after speaking with people, what we believe they find engaging. We survey our people like twice to four times a year to judge the level, like to get verbatim engagement um, feedback. And then we have, you know, um, uh, initiatives around that. But I would say like the highest payoff is um, very easy to figure out because engagement scores at any business, even though we're in the same business, we've got the same salary and remuneration structures, um, we've got the same CEO, we're selling the same product, every department will be different. Every department's engagement level will be different because there's one variable and that's the manager. So if you if you say to me, what's the highest ROI for engagement? I would say making sure that you have a leadership team and a management team that people can come and learn from, be challenged, um, that display the company values the best and, and like show people through doing exactly what it means to be a shop backer. I'd say if you can get your management team 100% right, that's like the most invaluable thing you can do. And then beyond that is like, how can you give someone, someone learning and development opportunities beyond just giving them money to go and do a course online, giving them like real world and practical learning and development that stretches them that they, at the end of it, they go, wow, like I don't recognize, like me of 12 months ago, I don't recognize because I've grown so much. And that that's for me, the highest performers in our business. I see them saying that every 12 months is like, wow, I've really changed. And then they're like, well, why would I leave? Like I'm, I've got a great manager. I'm being challenged a lot at work. And yeah, by the way, we do, you know, drinks on a Thursday or we've got cheese and wine nights or trivia nights and all these kind of other things, right? Like we're not Google. We don't have bikes in a campus and a lunch person and a barista. But going back to it, Google does not have 100% retention either, right? Or even with those things. So yeah, that, that's what I'd index to, Andy. That's super cool, Gus. With all of these cool strategies you mentioned, whether it's marketing or sort of employment strategies or retention strategies, have a lot of these just came from yourself or are you sort of mirroring what has been working in Singapore and often going there and, and, and talking to, I guess, guess the founder or has is Australia quite independent and what you've done is quite sort of um, independent? Bit of, bit of both. So Australia is independent. Like we, we like to... Um, in the early days, hire a team locally that can stand up and run on their own. Um, you know, I, the CEO has talked about head office being not a head office. It's a, a functional area where you have the CEO who happens to sit and finance and HR teams are there. But what they, what at Shopback is, and this is the thing that I love about it. This is what keeps me engaged is that we're ultimately empowered. Every market can do um, localize their efforts and is empowered to make any decisions Um that they that's within their 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 um, ability to to localize and and grow effectively, and so I'd say that that's um, whilst we're decentralized in that sense, we also have the benefit of economies of scale in the sense that we have twelve markets now, all doing different things, um, all trying different um, you know running different experiments and innovating and launching new products, and we can very quickly scale those a, a winning strategy or a winning. Um, product or even down to a winning piece of performance marketing creative, we can quickly learn and scale that into other markets. So yes, we do get that network effect, I guess, um, when it comes to um, accelerating our growth. That's super cool. And how did you come about to sort of start shop back in Australia? Like, were you just brought in from the founder and you were sort of hired as a CEO or did you also found the company in Australia and you sort of partially funded it? How did cash back, shop back Australia come to be? Yeah. So I, I think, um, yeah, the, the shop back is, um, we, we, we have a very, very effective strategy of launching in new markets. So we, we have a, um, uh, without going into the details, we, we enter into a new market and there's um, early on very quick decisions on, even before the, the website's live, 
on bringing on bringing in the founding team for the for the market. And so that was at the point that I was brought in is to come in early, um, along with alongside some like our employee number one is still with us today. He's talking about retention. Um, one of the brightest minds in the affiliate space, you know, people like him and others, um, I partnered with earlier on and we we really grew it from there and, and scaled our headcount to where we are today. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not like a, <laughs> I'm, I'm on, I mean, I'm a shareholder in Shopback. We all are. Um, but that's the, my, my part is um, my part to play was kind of meeting the CEO early building, building trust that he thinks I'd be the kind of operator that would be able to deal with the early, the ambiguity of, that early stage companies bring alongside the, the other amazing people that we've got and and scale from there. As I've sort of brought on entrepreneurs and founders as well as sort of C-suite level sort of um, people at big companies, I'm, I'm often in awe just as I am on, on this podcast of like how knowledgeable you guys are and you guys are basically entrepreneurs. And, and I'm always like, wow, like there's, there's so much to learn. And, and I guess the entrepreneurs there is a different energy on the podcast, um, but you guys are just very similar where you guys are reading books, you guys are constantly learning, trying new things. You, you're, you're basically an entrepreneur. I guess, what do you find is the main difference? Like, have you ever had an urge to start something of your own? Because you have all the fundamentals, you have all the knowledge. Um, and, but I think there is a similarity between sort of C-suite, knowledgeable, sort of important. They, they, I, I don't know if it's sort of... Um, Maybe there's a missing DNA. Any thoughts, Gus? I, I think that um, I, I'm not sure about missing DNA, I, I, <laughs> but um, like I think, that, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's probably um, like we'll go back to your question. Like, have I thought about starting something of my own? Like, I actually feel like I've got that today, and and you know, I've, I feel extreme extreme ownership in my job and my you know, I've got a. Um, like a wonderful team that that we just we 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 can really move mountains, and so I feel like I don't ex like exactly have an itch to start my own thing. What I would say though is, I, I mean, I heard Simon um, from Culture Kings talking. Um, I know it of you know the the shop back founders in Singapore, and other founders I know is like those early early days. Like I'm talking day zero with with nothing. You know, like it really takes a a certain level of a certain person to deal with the trials and tribulations that you are for sure going to be met with over and over and over again as you scale. And as you scale, the problems only get bigger. I mean, you're you're the CEO, so all those problems naturally just gravitate straight to you. So then you're dealing with, and this is why I say it takes a different type of person. Let's go to the absolute limit, Elon Musk. Like he's got, what, five or six businesses now that are like at massive scale. And every single problem, whether it's like uh, investor related or whether it's um, a technical problem or marketing problem, they all find his way to him. And like, I don't, I don't know, like you have to be a different type of person that can still sleep and operate with that kind of weight on your shoulders. And I think day zero founders have that, like they need to have that or they don't, so they, they, they exit early or find a, a someone who's, like you see those early stage founders that get replaced after time because they just can't, they feel like their job isn't to scale with the business as the the CEO. Their job is then perhaps to then go back into an area where they're more, more interested in and um, can add more value. So yeah, I, I like the Elon Musk's book is, I mean, love or hate the man. Um, I, I like to think of it as like, you know, it's there's some parts that I want to take and I, I theoretically like. There's other parts that, seem very extreme to me when it comes to people management or different um, workplace philosophies. But I think like if you can, if you can learn by kind of just taking a couple of bits out of profiles of people that you really, really admire or think that are doing well, you know, for ideas are free, like all these management books and leadership books comes from someone who's been there and done that before. But I don't know, like, I can't think of like any like extremely groundbreaking things that I've read, they're just different perspectives and different ways of doing things. And you can you can ultimately shape them to be your own. That's beautiful. I want to wrap it up with some quick fire questions. Maybe there's like three or five and they're just completely random. Sure. I guess one, any difference between like the Singapore versus Australia market? 
because I know like even countries like China, people use WeChat to pay and every country has a different way of payment and you can't really educate your country to do what another country is doing. Um, yeah. What are the differences? Yeah, there's, there's some really big differences. Um, I, I'd say that number one is consumer shopping behavior. So like, you know, even up down to the hours in the day that people favor for shopping, a really good example is that like midnight drops of, you know, certain products or, or gift cards in Singapore work really well. They work here in Australia, but like people are happy to stay up till midnight and camp out to make sure they get the best offers. The other thing would be that their their like promotions calendar in Singapore in the Southeast Asian region is very different. Again, right? Like they've got these shopping events each month, which are double digit days. So like 8, 8, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11, 11, singles day, 12, 12. Whereas in Australia, we've got, you know, four or five key moments like Click Frenzy, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Boxing Day. Um, and then we've got emerging dates like Afterpay Day and Prime Day. But their, 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 their retail calendar and their shopping behavior is very different. The other difference I'd say is something that we're, we're finding very interesting is like QR payments over there for our in-store proposition. It's like reflex it's second nature you know they see a shop at qr they they know they can scan it straight away and pay um whereas in australia we're doing more of an education job but what we find is once that someone uses it for the first time their retention is quite strong and so it's not i'd say it's it does it, it do, it's not missing product market fit with that in mind it's just more that you know hey like we've got to try and do a bit of a job on, on educating here which is fine like everyone had to learn what a groupon was back in you know 20 2008 right like it's not impossible um so yeah i'd say they're kind of like two like practical examples is there anything that australia does that you guys discovered that singapore doesn't when it comes to purchasing behavior mm. yeah there's a few i'd say that um what people are most surprised about when i like other um, when i talk to others around the shop back region is how australian customers love to shop from a diverse set of uh brands so um you know, like there's like a, a like a, a really um deep choice. There's like a lot of choice or a wide range of choice, I guess, when it comes to merchants in Australia. Whereas if you go to other markets, you might find that there's like one or two super dominant marketplaces. So an analogy would be imagine if Amazon had 70% of wallet share in Australia and everyone else shopped from Amazon, uh, sorry, eBay and Timu. Like there was three key players and one was super dominant. So I think that they're really, they're interested to learn how, you know, perhaps they can um, help other, help customers shop from a wider range of merchants and not just like, you know, a few favorites that they favor. And the other one I'd say is like the, the one of the more macro differences is, is like, you know, the, it's like the Big Mac test, you know, a Big Mac in Australia is more expensive than a Big Mac in say, um, let's say the Philippines. And, and because of the, uh, um, the earning, like the the difference in the the economics in the in a country, and so I'd say that you know when it comes to shopping behaviors, there's like more frequent shopping at a higher average order value than than other markets as well. I love that. Another thing you mentioned was that I was surprised that seventy percent of the shopback users use an app because I've always been desktop native. I, I use Ozbug and there's the extension. And I think that's how I originated from. Yeah, how do you guys swing to a point where like 70% of people use the app? That's amazing. Yeah, and that was kind of our Trojan horse when we came into Australia was uh, no one else in Australia in, in the cashback and loyalty space had a, a mobile phone app and we we had to. So, you know, we were born in Singapore. We scaled across countries like Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan, Indonesia. In some of these markets, there's like no one uses a desktop. It, it's like it's mobile shopping only. And so to be present there, we had to have like a world-class app where people could, that people could use. And so by the time we launched Australia, it was market number five. We already had a highly developed iOS and Android app that when we launched, you know, we spent like, we spent a lot of money in the marketing dollar, uh, like in from the marketing budget driving towards app downloads. And that was actually quite a powerful thing because then that allows you to shop anywhere. You know, you could be on the bus or train on the way to work. You could be, you know, midnight shopping in bed. You could probably do other, you know, be doing better things like sleep. Um, but there's, um, we're, we're present then whenever the customer wanted us. And so it was like, you going back to that whole thing about convenience is be where the customer um, 
uh, need you and, and, and make sure that you've got the right offers at the right time with the right merchants. And I think that that was quite powerful and allows, allowed us to scale to a market leadership position pretty quickly. When people are using the app and scrolling in bed, are they scrolling through specific products within merchants or are they just scrolling through merchants and they have to click into the merchant and they can see what the merchant, what's that experience like when someone's in bed scrolling through Shopback? So like, so people can scroll on Shopback. You think about it this way, like for online merchants, our job is to help a customer discover the brand and get them to their brand site as seamlessly as possible for them to actually do their shopping. We need to get out of the way at that point and let them, the customer do their shopping. So customers browse shop back for offers. So they might want to see online brands. They might want to see gift cards um, that we've got. And, or they might want to gift a friend a gift card. They might want to see what merchants we have um, in store. We also have challenges, a product called challenges, whereby it might be like, hey, if you shop at eBay today, today you get a $5 bonus or check into the shop back app every uh, once a day for seven days and get a special prize. Like there's gamification built into it as well. Um, that customers can come and browse from. So there's there's we try and make it as fun and engaging it as in gamified as possible. But at the same time, you'll be careful because at the limit you can make it the world's most confusing way to shop. Or at the margin, it can just be a list of brands, like a list of logos. So you've got to be somewhere in between, which is like an engaging app, something that customers want to come and browse because they feel like it's personalized and targeted towards them. And um, at the same time, get out of their way and help them um, uh, make their transaction as quickly as possible to be rewarded. And you briefly just mentioned marketing. When you guys run those sort of marketing campaigns, are you guys optimizing for app installs? And if so, how do you know how much you're willing to pay for an app install? It depends on the type of campaign. So we might be running like upper funnel campaigns that are just trying to do a brand job. So it's like disruptive, creative that makes you look and engage. Then, you know, we'll we'll say that we're happy for a, a, a cost per install or impression at that at this price. Um, there might be a more lower funnel campaign that we're running that we know that predictably over time, we've been able to drive cost per installs down. And um, through, you know, working, it really comes down to the creative, like, and that's my point before was like, if you can't just put a set of, you can't just put a creative live on Facebook and let the algorithm do its job, like, or put multiple variations of it, let the algo do its job. You have to be looking at that daily and going, okay, like this one's performing, these ones not kill scale, but then with this one, we're scaling what jobs are doing and how can we then um, innovate or, or just change the creative a little bit, put more of them out test the variations like it's a really it's, it's actually quite interesting when you start to get to the bottom of what customers at scale are, are interested in and clicking on and then trying to go okay so then how can we then like how can, how can we change this up a bit and there is like we're early stages there are some interesting ai platforms that can help you do um, performance marketing creatives but i would say that like this stage they hallucinate a little bit too much there's there's not there's not enough accuracy in the output to then say, okay, this is something that we'll bet big on. It's still like, you know, humans love humans. The video works. Um, not don't make it clickbaity because then your bounce is too high. So I'd say that there's um there's a lot of factors there, but just knowing what the job the creative's supposed to do and then optimizing it to the benchmark costs that you've got um, and killing it or scaling it depending which way it goes is is half the job. Yeah. And are you optimizing for if it's a rich campaign, the lower CPMs? Um... Yeah, yeah. So, and I think that that's that's like you got to be like we always back ourselves. It has to come back to an ROI. And so, you know, brand marketing, we can quarantine some budget to say, you know, this this isn't going to drive us, you know, a, a, a demonstrable uplift in new customers or signups or downloads. But hey, what is that supposed to do then? Like, let's be clear on the the job that this creative is doing, and hold ourselves accountable to it. Because you like you can't just do some creative, pump money into into the platform, and then like say goodbye. You you've got to have benchmarks, and you've got to be willing to say this worked, this didn't. So that next time you want to run brand, that you know exactly, you know where where the benchmarks are with respect to whatever performance it is. So. You know, is it an uplift in brand awareness? Um, is it an uplift in brand recall? Is it an uplift? Like there's so many different ways that you can 
run a campaign and then go out and survey all poll users and see if there's been a change in some metrics. And we'd like to try and not make them make them um, as like make this the metrics as sensible as possible and avoid vanity metrics that you know like impressions and reach like it's great but it's just a factor of how much you spend and like a bit of a factor of how good the creative is like do you really shift brand awareness do you really shift unaided brand recall they're the things that matter yeah interesting yeah my my next question on that was and i think i might have answered my question you can let me know your thoughts um yeah. it's easier for uber to know how much they're willing to pay per app install you know 50 dollars per app install because they know the average customer would spend x money using uber but i guess technically you guys can do the exact same thing you guys have tracked how much a customer would spend um, on your platform and i guess the more customers the more that a customer spends the more valuable they are so i guess there's an average sort of lifetime spend of a customer yeah. and if you have the average lifetime spend you can just get a percentage average commission is let's say 10 percent. that's the value of the customer yep yeah i, I mean we know if to scientifically um the customer lifetime value and then how much we're willing to pay to acquire and how long that will take us to pay that back very late like, and that's something you, you need to watch that like a hawk and the reason for that is that let's say that your these are just round numbers but let's just say that your lifetime value of a customer is $50, but it costs you $100 to acquire that customer. The problem is that, okay, so you might say, oh, I've acquired a customer, but if they're only going to generate you $50 in lifetime value, then you're never going to be profitable, one. And then two, the problem gets infinitely bigger as you scale because the more new customers you you get, the more it's costing you because you're only you're, you're spending 100% more than what they're ever going to give back to you. So you need to know, you need to know what your customer acquisition costs are for, but before that you need to understand what your lifetime value is and what the industry norm for payback is. Cause if you, if you spending well above lifetime value or well above industry norms for payback to you, when it comes to like, um, uh, like outsiders looking at your business and, and how you're running it, that's for sure going to be one of the first things they look at. Can this business scale and be profitable? Like how much does their acquisition cost? What's retention look like? What's their lifetime value? Um, those are the, the fundamentals I'd say that you need to keep a, a hawk eye on. Another question I had, and, and I might already have the answer. You can let me know if I'm correct. When I was at Papa Rich and I just scanned the code and then they got a ping, they got an SMS code actually. Um, I don't even know if my name was on the SMS, but I was like, if there was a second counter, and me and a stranger both scanned the QR code at the same time and paid at the same time, and they only got one ping, or maybe they did get two ping, can a com confusion happen? But then I guess you can just have an SMS with my name on it as the ShopBack user, and that clears everything. But what if my name on ShopBack is different to my name on my... Do they check my driver's license? <laughs> no, no, no we, we give them... Um, we, we do one better. We've built a, an app. So merchants can download the app, and then they can see what orders have come through and so they'll be able to like even if you order exactly the same thing at the same time they'll be able to see who you are um on your in within your the customers app there's a um uh, a success payment success screen which they can also validate it's got it's got one of the holograms behind it so it moves when you you move your phone it's got a it's got an order reference number it's got the value so it's we i mean in the payments game you can't be anything but secure. Like, I mean, best practice across the all business. But when it comes with respect to payments and when it comes to people's money, whether it's customers or merchants, like we've got to have the the highest form factors in there that we can to make sure they're they um they're confident that their payments have gone through, that customers know it's the right amount. Yeah, they, these things that we've we've iterated and there's a whole product team looking at checkout um, and working working to innovate there. Have you guys built a payment gateway in-house or do you guys work with a Stripe or Squares payment? We work with pay payment gateways, yeah. So it depends, like, we're across multiple markets and, um, yeah, it, we've, we've got uh, a couple of payment gateways that we use. And then another quick question. Do you have a team member that just spends all day on Ozbargain, putting up offers, um, answering comments, or are you guys so big to a point where Ozbargain doesn't really move the needle anymore? No, no, it matters greatly. And yes, I do have a team member um, monitoring and, and engaging, whether it's publicly or through DMs with the community. 
uh, like I'd say that the one thing that we'll never forget is this, the support that we got in the early stages. Um, we've even had um, parties where we co-hosted with with Osbargan, so Scotty from Osbargan and I, you know, threw a pizza party and a games night and had the community come in along with that, there were many other events, but we we wanted to get involved. And so we like we've got like a, a deep level of respect and thanks for the community's support. And we 100% need to have someone watching it. Like it's such a big community of passionate people that love to shop. They love bargains. And um, and we can also, if someone's got a problem and they write on Osbargain, we can try and solve it there rather than, um, you know, handoffs to customer service. So, I mean, that's the dream state. Of course, it can't be done in every instance, but we, we do like to try and um, manage a community where they're most comfortable, which is, you know, on, on the threads and the, the posts that they're, that they're questioning. I love that. Gus, thank you so much for your time today. Where can people get more of you? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know about more of me. I don't know if you want more of me. No, you can connect with me, connect with me on, on LinkedIn, I guess. Just search Angus Muffet. That's my full name. Um, uh, and yeah, happy to, to, to connect. And I try and share a bit of content on LinkedIn. Otherwise, Andy, I really appreciate your time as well. Like it's, um, I, I thought it was very fascinating going over some old guests that you've had on on your pod. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for the opportunity to be a part of that. Oh, thank you so much, Gus. I love how broad your knowledge is. We hit so many different topics, and you're definitely like you have that founder energy where you've done a bit of everything, so you can answer all these different questions from like marketing to like to recruiting, to, you know, brand, you know, core values and like you've done everything. So that's so cool. And man, like the time just flew by on this episode. Usually I have like a, like a third party recorder and I reset it every 25 minutes, but I've not been successfully able to do it because I'm just like locked in and I forget to reset it. And I also love how passionate you are. And you also have that sort of Jeff Bezos, customer centric sort of mindset, Sam Walton, um, and, and I could sense it through our conversation. So yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, man. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully, we we'll catch up again another time. Most definitely, guys. If you made it this far, hope you guys got some value from today's episode. I'll see you guys next week on another episode of the podcast. Peace. See ya. Bye. Thank you so much for the time. I know we went over time, but this was such an episode. Like we knocked through like every single little question I had. Oh, uh, oh. So, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. See you, Andy. Bye, Bye mate. Bye.